Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at one of the hardest British Mathematical Olympiad problems that I've ever seen. It's a really interesting one, it involves some nice number theory, some nice proof by induction, and as with all Olympiad problems, there's probably a hundred ways to solve it, and so if you come up with a different way to me, feel free to share it down below, and if you're trying it by yourself, you can skip to the end to see my final solution. Okay, so I'm going to put the question up on the screen and read it to you. So the question says that for each integer n greater than or equal to 1, we let f of n be the number of lists of different positive integers starting with 1 and ending with n, in which each term except the last divides its successor. We're then asked to prove that for each integer capital n greater than or equal to 1, there's an integer lowercase n greater than or equal to 1, such that capital N divides the function of lowercase n. So let's write out what they've told us and process it. So we're told that for all big n that are positive integers, that there exists a lowercase n, which is a positive integer, such that n divides our function. What does that mean? It means that our function for some input of n has to be a multiple of every single positive integer at some point. That's what we're being asked to prove. And it also gives us some examples. It tells us that f of 1 equals 1, because of course the only list we could make would just be 1. It tells us that f of 3 is equal to 1. And it tells us that f of 6 is equal to 3. Now, to give you some intuition as to why, all of our lists have to start with 1 and end with our input. So we know we're going to have the list 1, 3 over here. There's no other lists we could make for an input of 3, because there's nothing that would divide 3 apart from 1, given that it's prime. And so this reveals that a number being prime and its factors are going to be the, one of the most important things to consider in this question. Again, with f of 6, we're always going to be able to write the list just 1 and our input, so 1, 6. But we could also write 1, 3, 6, or 1, 2, 6, because of course 6 is divisible by both 3 and 2. And so this gives us a taste for how the function actually works. And our first step is going to be thinking of a starting place. And can we form some conjecture that we can then prove by induction? And given that we're thinking about factors here, perhaps the best thing to do is to consider the simplest number in terms of factors. Our number is going to be a to the k, where a is prime and it has some number of factors k. And Let's see if we can analyse what the behaviour is going to be like by considering possible lists, right? So what are all the factors of a to the k? And we're not going to include 1 or a to the k because they go at the start and end. So we're not interested in them. What we're interested in is what happens in between our starting and final term. Well, we could always have an a, we could always have an a squared, we could always have an a cubed, and we could always go up to a to the k minus 1. So all of these factors could be in any order as long as it stays in an increasing power in between our 1 and a to the k. So our first possible list is just when we have nothing. That's when we choose nothing from this list and we just leave it as so. The next possibility is choosing 1 from this list and that would be we could have 1 a a to the k, 1 a squared a to the k, 1 a cubed a to the k, all the way up to 1 a to the k minus 1 a to the k. Our next option would be choosing two from our list. And it would continue like this until we've chosen every single number from this list and we've got one a, a squared, a cubed, a to the four, all the way up to a to the k minus one, a to the k. And I use the word choose deliberately here because what we're gonna be doing is from k minus one things, for our first part, we're choosing nothing. For our second part, we're choosing 1, for our third part we're choosing 2, and we're going to continue until we've got k minus 1, choose k minus 1. And we're summing these because each of these is giving us a possible number of lists, right? And this is something that many of you may have encountered before, I'm not going to prove it now because it's not what we're looking to do, but one of the fascinating things about the choose function and Pascal's triangle is that if you sum up all of the numbers on a given row of Pascal's triangle, you get the power of 2 that corresponds to that row. So if we're summing up all of the numbers on the k minus 1 row of Pascal's triangle, that sum will be equal to 2 to the k minus 1. So there's our conjecture. Let's try and prove it 
by induction. Base case is when k equals one, and on our left-hand side, that's going to be calculating f of a, which is clearly one because a is prime. And on our right-hand side, that's gonna be two to the one minus one, which is two to the zero, which is one. So it works for our base case. We're gonna assume that it's true for k equals n, and now we're gonna look at what happens for k equals n plus one. And at this point, I think it's gonna be useful to introduce another idea about the way that this function works. Given that our final or ending point is fixed, one of the best ways to think about the number of possible lists is to consider all the possible penultimate terms we could have in our sequence. So let's use the example f of 12. Ending with 12, we could have a penultimate value of six, of four, of three, of two, and of one. And of course there's going to be some number of lists that have that start with one and have six as a penultimate. We could have a three here and a one, we could have a two there instead, but it doesn't really matter. We don't need to calculate that because we've already done it. We know all the possible number of lists that have six as a penultimate because it's all the possible number of lists that have six as a final number because this 12 isn't really adding anything. And so really we can write f of 12 as the sum of values of the function that could be the penultimate term. Like so. And this is gonna be really crucial for our proof by induction step because of course if we're trying to find f of a to the n plus one, that means we can write it as f of a to the n plus f of a to the n minus one plus f of a to the n minus two, etc. And again, applying the same logic, which is really nice here, if we consider this sum, f of a to the n minus one plus f of a to the n minus two plus f of a to the n minus three, all the way to just plus f of one, well, that must be what f of a to the n is equal to. And so really, we've just got f of a to the n here. And so that means f of a to the n minus one is equal to two times f of a to the n. And we've already assumed that f of a to the n is equal to two to the n minus one. And so by induction, we've proved our conjecture. Of course, we'd have to write a nice conclusion about how the principle of mathematical induction has proved this for us. But essentially, we've arrived where we want to. So I'm gonna write this up here in the corner so we don't forget it f of a to the k equals two to the k minus one. But it seems like considering simple cases is good. So let's consider the next best simple case, a to the k times b, where a and b are prime. That's the form that number like six or 12 is in, right? It's that we've got one extra prime factor introduced and we want to see how that affects our behavior. And actually to form the conjecture for this, I'm going to use a specific case which is where two is a and b is three. And that's just because it's gonna help us to understand better what's going on in this situation. So let's think about the possible lists we could write. We're always gonna start with one and we could create a list of any number of possible powers of two all the way up to two to the power of k that would then end with two to the k times three. Any list of here would be, would be possible with choosing any one or not choosing any one in this sequence. And that's gonna leave us with two to the k possibilities as we already know. But we could also consider the impact that this second prime factor is going to have. So of course the, pen, the, the final term that we could have that includes our prime factor isn't three two to the k because that is our final term. We're looking at penultimate terms, so it's gonna to have to be three times two to the k minus one. So there's gonna be one less term in our bottom row here that includes our prime factor than in our top row. But we could follow the same principle, right? We could choose one and then we could choose three, six, 12, da, 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 all the way up to three times two to the k minus one. And that would be two to the k minus one, because we choose or not choose three, choose or not choose six, but it's gonna be one less than here because we've got one less term on our bottom row. And we don't have to stop there because we can even make our paths more complicated. We could choose a path that looks like this. 
And again, we choose or not choose two, choose or not choose six. We could choose a path that looks like this, where we choose or not choose two, choose or not choose two to the two, choose or not choose 12, etc. And so you can see how we, we can take any number of ones along our top row and then swap to the bottom row. And each time we do that, we're going to be adding two to the k minus one possible lists. And how many times could we take different paths? Well, it's gonna be k times. And so our conjecture is that our function of two to the k times three, but of course, really, we could generalize this to any case of a to the kb is equal to two to the k plus k times two to the k minus one, also known as k plus two times two to the k minus one. Now let's try and prove this by induction. So let's first consider our base case. At that point, we're trying to find f of a, b on our left-hand side, which by the logic we've already established earlier would be f of a plus f of b plus f of one, which is gonna be equal to three because this is one, this is one, this is one because these are both prime. And on our right-hand side, we're going to be calculating one plus two times two to the one minus one, which is three times two to the zero, which is three. So it works for our base case. We're gonna assume it for k equals n, and we're now going to look at what happens when k equals n plus one. So let's write out what f of a to the n plus one b is equal to. Well, similarly to how we laid out earlier, we're gonna have f of a to the n plus one plus f of a to the n plus f of a to the n minus one all the way up to plus f of a plus f of one. Sorry, I ran out of space a bit there. And we're also gonna have the possibility of f of a to the n b plus f of a to the n minus one b, etc., all the way to just plus f of b. But whenever we've got these sums going along like this, it's always interesting to consider what would the term previously look like? And this is a similar step to how we proved the last one. We looked at f of a to the n, and we noticed that this sum is essentially very similar to the one prior, which is a little bit extra. So f of a to the n b, of course, would be f of a to the n plus f of a to the n minus one, all the way to f of a and f of one. And then it would be f of a to the n minus one b plus f of a to the n minus two b, all the way up to plus f of b. And this is a really nice step to take because we can clearly see that most of this is contained up here. Ignoring our a to the n plus one, all of the rest of our sums of powers of a just are contained again within the term prior f of a to the n b. And similarly, apart from our f of a to the n b, starting from f of a to the n minus one b, our sum is exactly the same. And that means this entire part here can just be swapped out for f of a to the n b. And this makes our life a lot easier because this is equal to, well, f of a to the n plus one by our conjecture from earlier is two to the n. And then we're just adding two times f of a to the n b. And we've already assumed that f of a to the n b is equal to two plus n times two to the n minus one. And if we simplify this out, we're adding two n to two plus n times two to the n, and that's equal to three plus n times two to the n, and so we've proved it by induction. That's great. The reason this is such good news is because now we've introduced a factor in our expression for the function that could take any integer value. F of a to the kb is equal to k plus two times two to the k minus one, which means that we could choose this k plus two to be any positive integer and it would be divisible by that integer. So setting n equal to k plus two, or in other words, choosing an input of a to the power of n minus two b, will always be able to be divided by n because it's going to be equal to n times two to the power of n minus three. Now, actually, we don't have to consider any other cases here because when n is equal to 
2, a value for the function that's divisible by 2, it's clearly just going to be f of a squared, because that's equal to 2 to the 2 minus 1, which is 2. I think this is such a lovely question, um, and there's definitely lots of other ways to go about this, so please feel free to comment them down below, but I, def I wanted to share this because I thought it was so good. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye.